This Sunday, the heat is on. Terribly hot. I mean, I can't handle it sometimes. Record high, triple digit temperatures across the country. It's sweltering. And what's the worst is there's no air moving. And across the globe, this is President Biden's ambitious climate agenda faces an uphill battle in Congress. As president, I'll use my executive powers to combat climate, the climate crisis in the absence of congressional action. This morning, my interview with former Vice President Al Gore on the inconvenient truth about global warming and what needs to be done now. Plus, 187 minutes. I don't want to say the election is over. The January 6th committee on how former President Trump refused to help quell the violence at the Capitol. President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home, he chose not to act. Even as Secret Service agents scrambled to get Vice President Pence out of danger. If we're moving, we need to move now. And testimony that Mr. Trump took care to stay on the side of the mob. The president did not want to include any sort of mention of peace in that tweet. This morning, I'll talk to committee member Elaine Lurie about where the investigation goes next. Also, the economy. We're taking our own steps that we believe will be supportive in the short term to get inflation down. I'll interview Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on inflation, economic pessimism, and whether we should expect a recession. Joining me for insight and analysis are Yamiche Alcindor, moderator of Washington Week on PBS, Jake Sherman, co-founder of Punchbowl News, Maria Teresa Kumar, president of Voto Latino, and Stephen Hay, editor of The Dispatch. Welcome to Sunday. It's Meet the Press. From NBC News in Washington, the longest running show in television history, this is Meet the Press with Chuck Todd. Good Sunday morning. And if you're waking up to another hot, sweaty day, you're not alone. Over the past seven days, there have been 359 daily high temperature records set across this country. And across the Atlantic, Europe is burning up as well. More than 1,700 people died in Portugal and Spain alone in this current heat wave that they're experiencing. In his 2006 documentary film, An Inconvenient Truth, former Vice President Al Gore warned that we were going to experience rising temperatures, melting glaciers, drying lakes, more wildfires, and stronger storms over the next 20 or 30 years. Well, guess what? In the 16 years since that film debuted, we've seen rising temperatures, melting glaciers, drying lakes, more wildfires in more states in this country, and yes, stronger storms. We've experienced a lot of that in the last 10 days alone. So despite all of the evidence staring us in the face like a hot sun, the United States remains a reluctant soldier in the fight against global warming. Just this month, Democrat Joe Manchin punted again on what was left of President Biden's climate bill, which was already opposed by all 50 Senate Republicans. In his documentary, way back in 2006, Mr. Gore said this. Are we, as Americans, capable of doing great things even though they are difficult? Are we capable of rising above ourselves and above history? Well, the record indicates that we do have that capacity. And joining me now is Al Gore. Uh, Mr. Vice President, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you very much, Chuck. Uh, thank you for inviting me. You know, this week felt like your PowerPoint from Inconvenient Truth come to life. Some of the headlines, the Colorado River having to do water rations, the monarch butterfly declared an endangered species. We had the ice melt in Greenland, record high temperatures in the UK, wildfires in France and Greece. The Rio Grande is running dry in New Mexico. It's here. How much uh, do you look back at what you warned and suddenly you see it come to life? Well, I, I wish the scientists had been wrong in their predictions uh, going back decades now, Chuck. All I have done is really convey the, uh, the scientific uh, facts as the scientists have patiently explained them to me. It's uh, due to get much, much worse and quickly. But we have the ability to stop temperatures from going up. If we got to true net zero, the temperatures on Earth would stop going up with a lag time of as little as three to five years, almost as if we flipped a switch. And if we stayed at true net zero, 
then half of the human caused CO2 emissions would fall out of the atmosphere in as little as 25 to 30 years. And we have the solutions available. Right. Uh, we need to deploy them quickly. Let's talk about the issue, though, that I think is, is, is probably the biggest challenge, and that is political will. And it's not just in this country. China and India are emerging powers that are relying on fossil fuels. Uh, Europe is backsliding with the decision on methane. Uh, how, if, if the United States can't be a global leader here, uh, who will? Well, uh, the United States uh, must step up and provide leadership. And of course, President Biden's been trying to do that. Uh, and uh, he has a 50-50 Senate, uh, really a 49-51 Senate on everything related to the climate uh, and a razor thin majority in the House. You know, um, Abraham Lincoln once said, uh, with public sentiment, everything is possible. Without it, nothing can succeed. Uh, the rest of us need to step up. Uh, the one thing that Senator Manchin said that I really agree with is that if we want more pro-climate policies, we need to elect more pro-climate uh, senators and representatives in both parties. And we've got an election coming up. And uh, th this is time for all of us to step up. You know, the climate deniers uh, uh, are really in some ways similar to all of those uh, almost 400 law enforcement officers in Uvalde, Texas, who were waiting outside an unlocked door uh, while the children were being massacred. They heard the screams, they heard the gunshots, and uh, nobody stepped forward. And God bless those families who've suffered so much. And law enforcement officials tell us that's not typical of what uh, law enforcement usually does. And confronted with this global emergency, what we're doing with our inaction and failing to walk through the door and stop the killing uh, is not typical of what we are capable of as human beings. We do have the solutions. And I think these extreme events that are getting steadily worse and more severe are really beginning to change minds. We have to have uh, unity as a nation to come together and stop making this a political football. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. You know, it's interesting. Public sentiment uh, on climate is, is certainly, uh, in some ways, growing more urgent. And you've made notice that rank-and-file Republicans uh, are growing more concerned about the climate. But, you know, public opinion is on one side on abortion, is on one side on guns, is on one side on climate, and yet you see that it hasn't mattered to some of the decisions that are made in our politics. How do you how do you break through this? Well, you, you're exactly right. Uh, and public sentiment is changing, but our democracy is broken. And in order to solve the climate crisis, we're going to have to pay attention to the democracy crisis. The same reason that uh, it's Im seemingly impossible for the Congress to pass legislation banning these uh, uh, weapons of war, these assault rifles that are being used to murder children in classrooms and uh, create hundreds of uh, mass casualty events uh, already this year, and that's getting worse. The same reason we can't pass legislation to, for example, reinstall, re reinstate the ban on assault weapons is the same reason that we can't pass climate legislation. We have a minority government. We have the filibuster still, which ought to be eliminated. We have uh, big money playing much too large a role in our politics, lobbyists uh, uh, for the fossil fuel uh, industry, and they're still running all of these advertisements trying to convince people that it's not that bad or they've got this, don't worry about it. We have got to rise to this challenge, uh, Chuck. You know, what you see behind me uh, is a picture from the space station showing how thin the atmosphere is. If you could drive to the top of that blue line, uh, at, uh, drive straight up in the air at interstate highway speeds, you'd get to the top of that line in about five minutes. And below you would be all of the greenhouse gas pollution. Uh, we're using that as an open sewer, dumping 162 million tons into it every day. And the accumulated amount now traps as much heat as would be released by 600,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding on the Earth every day. And we have the solutions. Renewable energy from wind and solar is now cheaper in 
almost the entire world uh, than uh, electricity from fossil fuels. Uh, those utilities here in the U.S. that have doubled down on uh, gas are seeing their rates go up, while those who are right. picking solar and wind, their rates are going down. Look, solar is, uh, appears to have kept uh, Texas from having brownouts uh, because they expanded their, their solar on the grid. But let me ask you this. It, what should President Biden do now? Uh, besides advocating for more pro-climate senators, uh, that's a ballot box solution. Is there anything he can do in an executive uh, aspect of things um, around Congress right now? Well, I welcome his announcement this week to uh, jumpstart the offshore wind industry uh, in the U.S. And he's taken quite a number of other uh, important actions, and he's reversed some of the terrible policies of his predecessor. Uh, but he needs congressional action in order to take the bold steps that are really needed. Uh, there, there are many other things right. that he can do. He can stop uh, approving any more fossil fuel uh, development on federal lands and permits uh, for yet more fossil fuel development. The International Energy Agency says that uh, we should not have any new oil and gas fields <laughs> developed if we want to see the survival of human civilization as uh, in anything resembling its current form. And yet inflation and the price of gas. You, 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 you were an elected official. You know that you know the burden of that that hangs on these politicians. You know, it, it short term, long term, I, you see the pressure President Biden's under. Yeah, and as the Secretary General of the United Nations said, as long as we feed our addiction to fossil fuels, we're going to continue to place political leaders into these untenable positions where all the choices uh, are bad. We can't confuse the short term with the long term, Chuck. Uh, getting through this crisis with Russia's invasion is, is one thing. Getting past the election with gasoline prices, you know, they're already coming down. Uh, that's one thing. But investing in more fossil fuel infrastructure that will yep. guarantee emissions uh, increasing for decades into the future, that's a horrible mistake that, that uh, at this point, we simply cannot afford to make that mistake. I want to shift. You talked about the broken democracy, and your, uh, your uh, concession speech from 2000 was invoked at the, at the hearing. I want to play a, a, a clip of that and what uh, Mr. Pottinger, who testified, said about it. Let there be no doubt, while I strongly disagree with the court's decision, I accept it. And tonight, for the sake of our unity as a people and the strength of our democracy, I offer my concession. His speech is actually uh, a pretty good model, I think, for any candidate of, for any office, uh, up to it, including the president, and from any party. Vice President Pence has been called a hero by some for what he did on January 6th. What say you? Uh, well, in the current environment, just doing what the law and the Constitution requires uh, seems uh, heroic to some. I'm glad he made that decision. You know, he was a freshman congressman sitting in the chamber when I counted uh, the electoral votes uh, in, uh, in, in early January of 2001. Uh, I think that uh, those who have tried to continue promoting uh, doubt and suspicion about the efficacy of our democracy are really uh, performing in an anti-American way, and they should be held to account. And that committee, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, I want to congratulate Benny Thompson and Liz Cheney and every single member of that committee. They are performing an historic service to our nation. Uh, I'm not going to let you go without asking you this. Australia election was a climate change election and that and and you talked about in order to get that political will um jay Inslee tried to run a climate focused campaign and it didn't get off the ground why not you al gore why not me uh leading a climate uh, a change candidate? presidential campaign in the future oh well thank you for uh, making the suggestion uh uh, you know, I'm a recovering politician, and the longer I go without a relapse, the less likely one becomes. But the idea of you, climate change and making it the issue, would you like to see more presidential candidates do it? Absolutely. Public sentiment is changing very dramatically, but we need more grassroots 
action on the part of Americans, not only in the uh, upcoming congressional races and the presidential race in 2024, but in the local races and in the state elections yeah. as well. We, the people, have to solve this, and we have to uh, instruct those who are in positions of leadership to start doing the right thing. Our survival a as a, a species may depend upon it. Al Gore, thanks for coming on, sharing your perspective uh, and your leadership on this issue. I appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. When we come back, the January 6th hearings. Will they lead to a criminal prosecution of former President Donald Trump? I'll talk to the Congresswoman who led Thursday's hearing, Elaine Luria of Virginia. Stay with us. Welcome back. As more people provide information to the January 6th committee, the co-chair, Liz Cheney, says the dam has begun to break against former President Trump when it comes to more witnesses coming forward. The last hearing, for now, detailed how Mr. Trump refused to do anything to stop his supporters from ransacking the Capitol and threatening Vice President Pence and members of Congress. So what is next? Will the committee make a criminal referral? Will the Justice Department decide to prosecute Mr. Trump? And what has been the political cost to the former president? Joining me now is a committee member who led Thursday's hearing. It's Democrat Elaine Luria of Virginia. Congresswoman, welcome back to Meet Thanks the Press. So the dam has begun to break. Obviously, that means more evidence, more witnesses. But let me ask about a specific witness that we've not heard from that is probably the biggest one besides the president, and that would be Mark Meadows. Are we going to hear from him, or is the extent of his cooperation all that we got? I have no indication right now um, that he is, you know, changed his position or willing to come forward in any way that he wasn't before. As you recall, he gave us a trove of text messages, which have, you know, led uh, us to a lot of other information relative to the investigation. But um, ever since we subpoena him, he defied that subpoena. The Justice Department essentially threw that case out. There's not, um, to my knowledge, uh, been any change of mind on his behalf. You know, it's interesting. You talked about that you guys made a criminal referral to the Justice Department, and they threw it out. Um, but they just got a conviction on Bannon. Mm -hmm. Do you want them to revisit the Meadows decision? Um, well, I don't know the process by which, you know, I don't think that mm -hmm. they can revisit something that, that they've already dismissed. But um, he's certainly someone who has probably more information than anyone, um, you know, other than the folks we've already heard from who were in the White House that day. Um, so that information will be incredibly helpful, but we've been able to piece together so much, as you've seen, mm -hmm. um, Cassidy Hutchins and Sarah Matthews, other people who were present in the White House. And so if he's listening, we'd love to hear from him. This has been a very orderly way that you've you sort of showcased uh, the evidence as you've gotten it. And it, it feels somewhat conclusionary, and yet now you say they're going to be hearings in September. Are, it, what part of the timeline should we expect? Is this more about January 6th and after? Is that what we should expect in September, more about his actions on January 7th, 8th, and 9th? Well, so, you know, you said the dam, Liz Cheney mentioned the dam is broken. Sort of the floodgates have opened. I mean, I think when we initially planned um, the arc of, you know, the, the story, the information, the way we would present that through these hearings, mm -hmm. we thought that the hearing this week would be the final hearing. Uh, but so many more witnesses have come forward. You know, we've got new information that we're requesting and receiving as well from the Secret Service, and there's just a lot of questions um, still to be answered on that front. Um, so I think that's something we're still working through, taking in this new information, putting it on top of laying it on top of what we've already presented. Um, so I think there'll be some uh, information that covers the whole span, uh, but probably more in-depth and more conclusive about maybe some things we didn't know as much about. I mean, there's still so much out there that we don't fully understand yet. You know, in my library at home, I have paperbacks of the Warren Commission, the Iran-Contra hearings, of the Watergate hearings, of the Star Report. Is there going to be a January 6th committee, you know, basically report that the American people tangible that they will have in their hands and if so when? That will be the final product of the committee. I think that the timeline for uh, putting that report out, it, it's still to be determined as we continue to well, do the investigation. it has to be before January 3rd, 2000, right? It has to be before January 3rd of next year, given this Congress ends. Yes, but, um, you know, many folks have, you know, said, would that be before the election, after? I mean, you know, we're not looking at it um, through a political lens of the midterm elections. We're looking at it through getting to the truth uh, about the events of January 6th. And, you know, we're actively continuing the investigation and right. on a parallel path, um, you know, working on putting together the information for the report. Now, recommendations. I mean, that's the most important part of this because right. as a congressional committee, we're tasked with providing recommendations to prevent something like this in the future. I want to ask about the decision to grant anonymity. Um, 
because, you know, at the end of the hearing on Thursday, uh, Vice Chair Liz Cheney praised the courage of the witnesses that have risked so much to publicly come forward. I mean, we saw in real time what Sarah Matthews went through just, you know, with, with former colleagues attacking her on social media in real time. So on one hand, you've got these brave folks coming out and putting their name and face and reputations on the line, and then you granted anonymity over here. I bet you there's a lot of witnesses that wish they could have gotten that anonymity. Explain why you granted it. Well, we did that in the case of some national security professionals, um, and I think it's very important uh, both for their continuation of the roles in which they serve um, and also, you know, this is one of those things that's really the most disturbing about this. You know, I served in uniform for 20 years and understanding um, that there's a lot of people who are professionals um, who have information, uh, but they've seen what happened in the Trump White House for people who came forward and how they had retribution, retaliation. I think those people fear that if Donald Trump ever came near the White House again, they'd have a target on their back. I understand that, one. but, you know, anonymous sources, look, in my business, anonymous sor sources are certainly helpful and useful, but to the public, it gives them skepticism. And using an, anon I mean, it, an anonymous source, it does lessen the credibility of that totally information in the disagree. eyes of some people. No, well, I would say I totally disagree. I think we have to respect um, the uh, privacy, and in mm -hmm. this case, anonymity, and safety um, of these people, um, both from a physical safety standpoint, but also um, for them to be able to continue um, their roles in government un unimpeded. So it was a decision that we made in the committee really easily because we understood the importance of maintaining um, their anonymity. But the takeaway from it mm -hmm. is the fact is that if the Trump administration were to come back again, these people, they fear retaliation. Right. Um, the Justice Department, are you seeing any signs? I know you've been among those frustrated about the, what appears to be a lack of a criminal investigation. Do you see any signs that one's been opened? I sure as hell hope they have a criminal investigation at this point into Donald Trump. Um, I have no direct knowledge of the status of their investigations. But what I'd say is, you know, I can tell the Department of Justice is watching our hearings closely. There have been cases for criminal defendants who have been charged and found guilty uh, for events on January 6th. And they have actually quoted testimony from the January 6th mm -hmm. witnesses and hearings. So. Um, you know, Merrick Garland has already told us he's listening, and I, if he's watching today, I'd tell him he doesn't need to wait on us because I think he has plenty to keep moving forward. How do you guys, the Georgia investigation, which is happening simultaneously, has there been any overlap there at all, or is that, is that something that, that essentially you guys are observers of? Um, I'd say the latter. Okay. Yeah. Um, Liz Cheney gave a pretty impassioned speech and yeah. praised how many women have had the guts to come out versus the men that have hide behind executive privilege. That was privilege. very clever. <laughs> um, it, was, it was an interesting take. Um, and I know you've grown uh, professionally pretty, pretty close to her. Look, her primary in Wyoming may go a way that she doesn't want it to go. Um, but would you like to see her run for president in 2024? I admire Liz Cheney. I've been friendly with her ever since I came to Congress, even before we served mm -hmm. on this uh, committee together. And I think, you know, if she doesn't, you know, come through this primary and come back to Congress, there are so many things that she can do um, in the future for our country. I'm asking and whether you would support her running for president, <laughs> but as somebody, do you think her voice should be, is needed? Her voice is absolutely needed, and I think she's one of, unfortunately, a very small number of people who need to be the face of the Republican Party in the future. I would love to get back to where we had two political parties that, you know, debate on issues and facts and not, you know, lies. Um, and I, you know, really hope that Liz Cheney will continue Man. and uh you know i don't want to speculate she's her said so, said herself she doesn't know what her future plans would we be we shall but, see yeah. but there's definitely uh, the need for a leader of a pro-democracy yeah. wing of the gop elaine yes. Lorena, uh congresswoman democrat from virginia thanks Thank very you. much all right we're going to continue our conversation here about january 6 and what the investigation may do to donald trump both politically and legally here panel is here yamish alcindor who of course is uh works here at nbc news and is the uh, co uh, host of Washington Week on PBS, Jake Sherman, the co-founder of Punchbowl News, Stephen Hayes, editor of The Dispatch, and Maria Teresa Kumar, president of Voto Latino. Um, I want to start, I, I ended with Liz Cheney there, and I want to start with her, but I want to start with her uh, diagnosis of, of how Donald Trump weaponized parts of the Republican Party. Take a listen. Donald Trump knows that millions of Americans who supported him would stand up and defend our nation were it threatened. He is preying on their patriotism. He 
He is preying on their sense of justice. And on January 6th, Donald Trump turned their love of country into a weapon against our capital and our Constitution. Steve Hayes, I thought that was, that was an, you know, when we go to this idea, don't attack Trump supporters, Brett Stevens' column from the New York Times this week, I thought this was a fascinating way for her to try to show how Trump manipulated these people. Yeah, and I think she's absolutely right. And if you look at what's happened over the course of these hearings, they've provided the details of how she's right. I mean, this is what Donald Trump has done. He's telling people who, you know, they're, they're, there's a, a huge group of Republicans who don't pay attention to every twist and turn of what's happening in Washington the way that we do. They're living their lives. They're raising their families. They're going to work. And they're not, they're not aware of all of the things that Donald Trump has done. I think one of the things the hearings has made clear is that if you thought on January 6th or January 7th that there was this rally and Donald Trump had the right to, to raise objections and you weren't really paying attention, but that, you know, ultimately this wasn't really Donald Trump's fault. The hearings have made clear that this was a plan, a multifaceted plan, detailed, laid out in advance with the help of top Trump advisors and crazy people who are not Trump advisors. Just showing that and providing the facts from people who worked for Trump. I mean, that, I think, is what's made these hearings so effective, is they came from Republicans, and not just Republicans, but Republicans who chose to dedicate their career to working for Donald Trump. These are the people making the case against Trump. So, Yamiche, it's sticking as a narrative. Is it going to have a in political impact? I mean, that is the key question. It, it is uh, the question that I think is sort of unanswered when I talk to Republicans, um, both those who are horrified by what, by what former President Trump did, as well as those who are still supportive of him. They all think that the, that the opinions were sort of hardened long before these hearings, that these hearings have brought out new information. But in terms of sort of whether or not you think Donald Trump was wrong to do January 6th, wrong to, to, to pour gasoline on the fire at 224 when this mob was already in the Capitol and former Vice President Mike Pence is running through the halls and, and, and being evacuated. They say that this really isn't going to make a big political difference. Of course, we're the midterms are a long way away. 2024 is even farther away. And Liz Cheney's words could be a model for the kind of Republican argument for someone who wants to win the nomination if Trump ends up getting in the race. But I will also say that when you think about what former President Trump is doing, even this week, he is continuing to try to get the, the election overturned, right? He's calling up Wisconsin officials this week trying to get them to, uh, to change their results. This is someone who is stuck to this plan, who is believing that this is just sort of the way forward, and he has a large base of people who are still continuing to support him. And I will say one other thing. I watched this video on set with you, um, watched the hearing on set with you and Lester Holt and so many others, and I'm still sort of baffled by the fact that this happened. It's still surreal that people broke into our Capitol and that Donald Trump hasn't been completely excommunicated, not just from the Republican Party, but from the entire political atmosphere. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting, though, is that what Liz is referring to, is, Liz Cheney is referring to now, is that the fever seems to be breaking. The fact that Pence went into Arizona to go ahead and rally for another candidate. That's huge. The fact that his candidates, Trump's candidates, Dr. Oz and J.D. Vance, are not doing well, that they're in a dead heat, also speaks to perhaps their fever breaking. But the fact that on Friday, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Post went against Donald Trump and basically said that he was unfit for office regardless if there is a criminal indictment by the DOJ, that is big business. Well, the Murdochs have the Mur made it clear which side clear. they want to but be on. The, and this is the other thing, is that what we may be seeing right now is this Trump go at Ed alone? Is it more close to what Teddy Roosevelt did in 1912 with the Bullworth Bull Moose Party and said, you know what, I'm going to break off and cleave from the Republican Party and create my own. And that's something to watch. I think we as journalists and as political observers tend to overstate what people are going to vote for. I think that these hearings have laid a foundation in people's minds that uh, Donald Trump obviously was, I was I was in the Capitol on January 6th. He was obviously responsible in a major way. And the people who have, Kevin McCarthy and the Republican leadership, who have decided to not be a part of this investigation, I think that is going, it's the, probably the biggest act of political malpractice I have ever seen. And I think all of that will lay a foundation. Maybe it's not this election. Right. Maybe it's an election in the future. I, that's, that, that's, I, I, that's, I think that's where I lean, is that it's less 22, probably more 24. But here's one truism, and i got to go, which is, Candidates that are focused on the past usually don't do well.
Coming up, we're going to turn to the economy and the growing fears that the country is headed to a recession. I'm going to talk to the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen, when we return. Welcome back. If there's one overriding explanation for President Biden's sinking approval ratings, well, as James Carville once said, it's the economy, stupid. Wage gains are being gobbled up by inflation, which increased by 9.1% in June over last year, the highest rate in more than 40 years, which is a phrase we've said after every inflationary report over the last six months. Just this past week, Mr. Biden's approval rating on the economy in a new Quinnipiac poll was just 28%, with 66% disapproving. Inflation was by far the most significant issue cited. So let's dig into it. Joining me now is the Treasury Secretary, Janet Yellen. Secretary Yellen, welcome back to Meet the Press. Thank you. It's a pleasure let, to be with you. Let me just start with this. Many businesses seem to be preparing for a recession. Should all Americans at home be preparing for, what's, uh, for, for a recession that many people think now is likely? Well, um, look, the economy is slowing down. It, last year, it grew very rapidly at about 5.5%. And that succeeded in putting people back to work who had lost their jobs during the pandemic. The labor market is now extremely strong. Um, even just during the last three months, uh, net job gains average 375,000. This is not an economy that's in recession, but we're in a period of transition in which growth is slowing, and that's necessary and appropriate, and um, we need to be growing at a steady and sustainable pace. So there is a slowdown, and businesses can see that and that's appropriate given that people now have jobs and we have a strong labor market. But you don't see any of the signs now. A, a recession is a broad-based contraction that affects many sectors of the economy. We just don't have that. Consumer spending yeah. remains solid. Um, it's continuing to grow. Um, output, industrial output has grown in uh, five of the six la uh, most recent months. Um, credit quality remains very strong. Household balance sheets are generally in good shape. But inflation is way too high. And, um, the, you know, the Fed is charged with putting in place policies that will bring inflation down. And um, I, I expect them to be successful. The administration, for its part, is uh, supplementing those uh, yeah. Fed policies with things we can do. We've cut the deficit by a record one and a half trillion dollars okay. this year. Um, releases of gas from the Strategic Petroleum Reserve are putting some downward pressure on gas prices. We've seen uh, gas prices just in recent weeks right. come down by about 50 cents, and there should be uh, more in the pipeline. And hopefully we will pass a bill that will lower prescription drug costs right. and you, um, you, maintain current levels of health care costs. You seem uh, pretty optimistic, it sounds like, from that answer that we're going to avoid a recession. But I, I want to throw in two data points that you didn't bring up. One was these reports on Friday about both in the euro uh, uh, space and in, US, and in the United States that we've seen some contraction of business activity, throw in the uptick of unemployment, uh, uh, the weekly unemployment number there. Is that not the first sign of a coming recession, even if it's a mild one? Well, I, you know, I, I would say that we're seeing a slowdown. We're, we're likely to see some slowing of job creation. Um, but I do... I don't think that that's a recession. A recession is broad-based weakness in the economy. We're not seeing that now, and I absolutely don't think that's necessary. But look, there are also risks we have to appreciate. Inflation is high not just in the United States, but also in many, many of our neighbors in the UK, in Canada, in the euro area. Central banks are addressing that. We have a war in Ukraine that 
uh, mm -hmm. threatens uh, potentially even um, higher oil prices than we're seeing right now. One of the things that I've been doing in recent weeks is working with our allies mm -hmm. uh, to try to cap the price of uh, that Russia receives for its oil, both to diminish the revenues that Russia right. gets, but also to keep Russian oil selling in global markets so that when the next round of sanctions is put in place in December by the European Union, we're concerned that right. um, oil could be, significant amounts of oil could be shut in in Russia, leading to an oil price spike. So um, there are threats on the horizon. Yeah. Um, growth is slowing globally. And um, I'm not saying that we will definitely avoid a recession, but I think there is a path that keeps the labor market strong and brings inflation down. Uh, help us play armchair economists this week. There is a ton of data coming out this week. It's probably a, 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 a fun week for an economist because we're going to have consumer confidence survey, the second quarter GDP numbers. We got inflation numbers for June. Which is the indicator? What's the number you're most focused on that will give you a better indication of where this economy is headed? Um, well, I, I look at all the data and um, GDP will be closely watched. Um, a, a common definition of recession is two negative quarters of GDP growth, or at least that's something that's been true in past recessions. When we've seen that, mm -hmm. there has usually been a recession. And many economists uh, expect second quarter GDP to be negative. First quarter GDP was negative. So we could see that happen, and that will be closely watched. But I do want to emphasize what a recession really means is a broad-based contraction yeah. in the economy. And even if that number is negative, we are not in a recession now. And um, I, I would, you know, warn that we should be um, not, not characterizing that as a recession. I understand that, but you're splitting hairs. I mean, if the technical definition is two quarters of contraction, you're saying that's not a recession? That's not the tech. No? That's not the technical definition. There is an organization called the National Bureau of Economic Research that looks at a broad range of data in deciding whether or not there is a recession. And um, most of the data that they look at right now continues to be strong. I, I will be, would be amazed if the NBER would declare this period to be a recession, right. even if it happens to have two quarters of negative growth. We've got a very got strong labor market. Um, when you're creating uh, almost 400,000 jobs a month, that is not a recession. Uh, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury uh, and obviously the former chair of the Federal Reserve, always appreciate getting you on uh, and getting your perspective. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. When we come back, suspicious mind. Would someone's political party affiliation keep you from becoming friends with them? Guess what? A lot of Americans now say yes. Stay with us. Welcome back. Data download time and a look at our tumultuous politics over the past few years of the left Americans divided, alienated, increasingly suspicious of their fellow citizens. We politicize everything now. Making friends. University of Chicago offered a list of what's most important when it comes to making new friends. And a poli the political view of that person came out on top with 52% over even taste in music or entertainment and religion. Most, uh, another way of looking at our suspicion of each other. Uh, is the other party untruthful? 70% of Republicans believe Democrats are untruthful. And ready for this? 69% of Democrats believe Republicans are untruthful. So I guess you could say we agree on that. This pessimism overall in this poll showed up everywhere. 56% believe the government is corrupt and rigged. Ready for this? Another 49% say 49%, half of Americans believe they feel like a stranger in their own country. And this is a scary one. One in four Americans, 28%, believe we may need to take up arms against the government. This is a pessimistic electorate going into these midterms. What will this mean in November when we come back? We're going to take a look because guess what? It may not surprise you. 
Americans don't like their leadership here in Washington, no matter the political strife. Stay with us. We are back. Look, I want to show this set of numbers from Quinnipiac because this was a classic pox on all of Washington. Job approval ratings. The Supreme Court is the tallest little person uh, in the room here at sitting at an approval rating of 37 percent. President Biden is lording over congressional Democrats uh, with 31 percent job approval to their 30 percent job approval with Republicans in Congress, 23 percent. You know, this is the cross current, Maria Teresa, that is I think making the midterms like it's not a done deal yet. The midterms I can say right now is absolutely not going to be a blowout. In 2014, we saw the opposing party at least 30 points ahead of the Democrats at the time. And it was clear that they were going to change. Now it is a dead heat. You look at the Senate, it does look like you're going to have perhaps two senators, one from Ohio, one from Pennsylvania on the Democratic side. And among the Democrats inside Washington, it's like we may lose the House, but let's limit the losses. And while it looks like you, when you poll Republican against Democrat, it looks like it's almost a dead heat evenly. The moment that you put a MAGA Republican against yeah. a Democrat, that all of a sudden stirs a completely different reaction among the population. So I think it's going to be closer than folks realize. You know, Steve, it, it, every other midterm when the out party wins, they, they fashion themselves as something new. Right. Mm. That is the missing piece here for the GOP. They're not offering anything new. No, they're hoping to trade on volatility and the unpopularity of, yeah. of Joe Biden. If you go back, though, and look at, at races since 2006, every single election since 2006, with the exception of 2012, when Barack Obama was reelected, has been a change election. That is extraordinary volatility in our politics, and I think we're likely to see more of it now. Republicans, I think, could well succeed. I do expect that it will be a pretty good day for Republicans, certainly in the House, maybe in the Senate. Because they're not Joe Biden, because people are looking at these inflation numbers, because we could be on the verge of a recession, they, their view is we don't have to put forth much of an agenda. And to the extent that we do, it'll be negative for us. By the way, speaking of recession, boy, Janet Yellen seemed to preview that GDP might be negative this week. And a lot of people are going to say that's going to meet a definition of recession. Hey, but don't call it a recession. What do you make of that spin, Yamesh? It's well, one, it's, it's really interesting because obviously the Treasury Secretary and the White House, they don't want to be leaning in too much into negative language when it comes to the economy, especially because we're in this strange place in the economy where there's all these jobs, but still Americans are seeing low wages. They want us to get raises, but also people are just sort of tired of doing the sort of economy that we had pre pandemic. People want to have more flexibility. People are leaving their jobs. And then when I also looked at these numbers and we think about sort of the approval rating in Washington, I I was also went back and looked at the approval rating of scientists, of journalists. Americans are sort of in a position where they don't like anyone right now, and that probably benefits the Republicans. But there's also, of course, still abortion politics and sort of the, the way that Democrats want to mobilize on that issue. But I think overall, America's in a weird place because I think we're in this, we're still traumatized by the pandemic. We're still dealing with all of the things, um, all the challenges that are coming up. And then I think you also have Americans just sort of trying to balance the, their, I think, real apathy for all of the different sectors of government and science and the media. Part of me wants to just say, and, and this is based on conversations I've had on the Hill the last couple of weeks, is don't overthink it. I mean, Republicans have the largest majority in the House of Representatives that they've had, minority, sorry, in a very long time. It doesn't take a lot for them to have right. a historically large Republican majority. Will that happen? I have no idea. But it doesn't, if they win the mean, the average of what they would win in a midterm election, in the first midterm election of a president cycle, right. they're already in one of the largest majorities in a very long time. So I think that is that is what, and, and add on negative GDP numbers, add on a stagnant economy. And I think it's just, I think we're going to have a really good night for Republicans on Capitol Hill. The issue with the Senate races, though, is something that seems to be, I mean, it, it, it's, it is the story of 2010 uh, for the Republicans. Yeah. It was the story of it took, why it took them an extra four years to get the Senate the last It's really interesting to watch because you've had a bunch of Republican candidates, uh, Herschel Walker in Georgia, Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania, J.D. Vance in Ohio, who have, let's put it mildly, struggled a little bit, or uh, ranging from a little bit to a lot. And Mitch McConnell's super PAC, the Senate Leadership Fund, has not really gotten in and pushed their preferred candidates in a lot of races this cycle. I might get... They had threatened to. They threatened to, and they still might in Missouri if Eric Greitens nears that nomination. But it is very 
pretty interesting to see them kind of take this hands-off approach while Raphael Warnock is, you know, kind of eyes on the prize and, and charging ahead against a Herschel Walker, who a video came out last week where he was imagining to be an FBI agent, and he said he was an FBI agent. Republicans are kind of just sitting there on Capitol Hill being like, God, what is going on? What well, Trump uh, is going on? Well, <laughs> well, that doesn't explain. That doesn't explain weak candidates. No, but these, are, but these are all the three that you mentioned: J.D. Vance, yeah. Dr. Oz, and Herschel Walker. They're McConnell all, tried to stop all, all three. By exactly the way. right. But, that, but, but I mean, I think, halfway. And yeah. that could be. But that could be one of the reasons why Mitch McConnell isn't. He basically maybe he wants. He's like, let's go back to normal, where we are talking about policy as a Republican and Democratic party, and the only way to do so is by sacrificing some of these uh, senatorial seats. But well, at the so, same, I, I think Mitch McConnell very much wants. To be majority, majority leader. Agreed. I think nope. we do just about anything. And if, it, if it's J.D. Vance that gets in there, he'll take it. If it's yes. the great Walker, irony, he'll take it. I think the great irony is that the, the, clearly Donald Trump is pulling these candidates, making making fringe candidates more mainstream by supporting them and providing them with outside funding um, in a way that I think is, is ironic. When you look at the so-called establishment Republicans, you would expect that they might create more distance and might have a, a, a bigger fight but instead the national republican senatorial committee is sending out mail as late as this week saying endorse trump protect donald trump's legacy well this what gets me back to what, a midterm election yamish is normally supposed to be a referendum on the current party but the, the republicans are allowing another president to basically be on the ballot too so we are having a if the midterms are up no longer a referendum but a proxy fight between well, we know what that is. We're a polarized electorate. It's going to be a coin flip. Yeah, well, I, the question is, will we see the limitations of sort of celebrity and personality politics, right? So when we think about sort of all the people that you mentioned, Herschel Walker and J.D. Vance, um, part of what they're trying to do is recreate what former President Donald Trump did, uh -huh. which is not really have a lot of policies, but have people feel like you hear them, move people in a way You're that is You're describing the in Arizona Republican gubernatorial primary right now between right. sort of a... Uh, a wannabe celebrity Trumper yeah. versus somebody who sort of worked their way through the system. And with an electorate that's sort of angry at everybody, do they look up and say, you know what, I like this celebrity. He's kind of interesting yeah. to me. Or do they say, you know what, I'm going to go with the guy who's preaching at, Ma at Martin Luther yeah. King's church and I'm going to go there. Right. Well, I think but, the biggest coin toss uh, among the midterms is whether or not young voters and people of color come out. That's the, that's the coin toss. There. All yeah. right. That's it for today. We could have gone to overtime, but I'm out of time. Thank you for watching. We'll be back next week because if it's Sunday, let's beat the press. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.